actually mm -hmm. not the first time. We've done this a lot. Ooh, Ooh yeah, we have, because we're here. <laughs> we're in the studio, i.e. my kitchen. It's a beautiful kitchen, by the way. Thank and you. A beautiful studio. Small but functional. If this looks good, it's because this man made it look good. That's why. Preach. Preach. And who is this man? Who are you? What's up, everybody? My name is Ryan J. Whitehead. I'm, I was going to say Ryan J. Whitehead. <laughs> I just want to be you deep down and say, I'm Andrew Fantasia. I'm not Ryan J. Whitehead. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is Infinity Rewatch. And we just saw... Eternals. The, the Eternals. Is it is it just Eternals or The Eternals? It used to be The Eternals, and then yeah. they changed it. They're like, it's just called Eternals now. I guess the word the isn't cool. It isn't popular anymore. Uh, like, I was, I watched uh, the movie Color Out of Space last night based on the, the, the uh, Lovecraft short story. But oh, the short yes. story is called The Color Out of Space. But the word the is not cool anymore, kids. No. Nah. That's what your grandma says. It's for boomers. Boomers use the... We get right to the point. It's just Eternals. <laughs> and here it is. Now, I'm going to say this movie is an interesting pill to swallow. It's it's very complex. I think this is Marvel's most unique and experimental approach yet. Um, and I, I'm strictly talking about storytelling in this one. Uh, I think going... I want to... The one thing I wanted to talk about with this film is I want to talk about... First of all, going into the... I want to talk about specifically going into this film. Okay. Like, legit seconds before we sat down and, like, we're seeing Eternals. Going into the movie theater, I have only seen the one trailer, and I saw one clip. And it was just, like, a random... It was the... It was the... It was the Bollywood scene. Oh, okay. And it was just that one clip. So, I had, like, little to no expectations for this film. Because, first of all, as a comic book fan, I don't know the Eternals all that well. They're a very complicated story. Um, they did have a resurgence in 2010-ish, mm -hmm. um, and like they had a whole big thing about that. Uh, but I find their storytelling very complicated. And they did have a lot to do in the Infinity Gauntlet, um, in terms of just the Eternals and Deviants and all that stuff. Okay. But this time around, yeah, I'm, I'm going in here with very, very little equipped. Very little equipped for a Marvel movie like this. Same. I don't know Jack about the Eternals. Uh, one of them could be named Jack for all I knew going into it. Uh, all I knew was it was a Kirby thing. Hey, there's your Jack. Yeah. It was a Kirby thing, and it was cosmic. That's literally mm. all I knew. Uh, and that some people were really, really big, and they had a lot of eyes. So I was... Uh, what I liked going into it was I liked... I had no idea where it was going to go. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like... You know, with a Spider-Man movie... Good or bad, you you know what you're getting when you get into it. He's going to be in New York for a bit and probably shoot a web at somebody. Um, it with Eternals, I was completely just outside of my element. I'm like, what's, what's this? I see these trailers. They're on a yeah. beach a lot. There's a beach. There's some woods, and they're just having a great time. Uh, so I had no expectations, no nothing. Just I just went in thinking, let's see the next Marvel movie that happens to be about some folks. Who may or may not be gods. Yeah, this one, I, I can't get over how complex and big this story. This is a big story, and it's yeah. understandable the runtime for this, which I don't know if one of us predicted. I think, let me see. But I'm going to let the, you go back on that and, and get back the, to yeah, us on that. Keep talking. I have the predictions. So, so viewers, I, I don't think this one's going to be widely accepted by everybody. This isn't going to be one of Marvel's popular, more popular films. Like, it's not going to be like your, you know, Captain America or Song chi Like, it's not going to, or even like, you know, Black Panther. It's not going to come out strong on this one. I think there's going to be, I think this is going to have probably cult status among, among the Marvel fans. Um, the story is very scattered uh, in terms of the heroes. Uh, it, I think if I'm saying the best person to follow or what the story does is it makes you follow Cersei the most. And it kind of makes sense because she's kind of the bridge between, you know, how humanity, like her, the bridge, the connection between humanity and Eternals. And then kind of she's the middle central point. Um, the storytelling gets a little confusing throughout the movie. And at, from this point on, I'm going to get really spoiler heavy. So if you haven't seen it yet and you just want to listen to us, hey, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, but... Uh, if you do want to avoid any spoilers, we're, I don't think there's, it's hard to avoid them in this one. But uh, yeah, so from this point on, you've been warned, spoilers heavy, here we go. Yeah, mom, Quit, you spoil <laughs> movies for yourself all the time, mom. Um, all right. Um, according to Google, the like, official, official runtime of Eternals yeah. is two hours, 
37 minutes. Ooh. It did not feel that long. No. Um, you were definitely closer. You guessed 243. Oh! I guessed 206 because I was a Ooh. dumb dumb that day. What were you on? I don't know, man. Um, so that's two in a row, sir, that you have you have been closer on. Look at that. You're. I, I have a feeling I'm going to win No Way Home, though, because I guessed it would be longer than you. Oh, man. Yeah. Right. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so, yeah. So the story centered around Cersei a lot uh, and, and her relationships and kind of everything. Uh, overall, I think, this, I think this is a good story. I think it is. The problem I have with this movie is it kind of relies on Marvel fans' knowledge of the Marvel cinema or like the Marvel universe. But the problem with that is, is that because the cinematic universe is different from the comics, then how can you really base your knowledge on the comics? Well, so exactly. You're kind of, so you're kind of stuck in limbo here. Um, but the movie does, I think what's interesting is, and I think the big thing you have to think about going into this film, is the tagline of this film, which is the end of an era, beginning of a new era. And so the kind of cool thing is, is in that statement, the movie kind of kicks off kind of going into the history of Earth itself and, and the role of the Eternals being, like, it's kind of a funny play on words if you think about it, these eternal beings living through the evolution of Earth. Um, so that was kind of interesting to me. Yeah, I, a lot of this was interesting to me. A lot of this world building really hit me in the right places. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what this was to me? This was the the MCU's equivalent of the Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. Wow. This was the big, thick, wordy, heady, epic, biblical backstory that you don't necessarily need to read to appreciate Lord of the Rings. Yeah. But once you've read it, you know, when the elves start talking funny in Galadriel's house, you're like, oh, I know what they're talking about because in verse 6, chapter 12 of Silmarillion, the elf prince Feanor and his brother Fingolfin went to the top of the mountain and they said this same word. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of just dense, crunchy world building, which I love. Yeah. I think that's why of the four of us who went, I think I'm the one who walked away the most like, yeah! Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, our usual uh, guest co-host that comes on, Anna, she she was not a fan. We'll let we'll give her a chance to vent one day when she comes back on the show, uh, when she gets some free time to do that. Uh, very busy right now. But, um, but yeah, she had some interesting points of view from her perspective because I there are some things I agree with, and mm -hmm. and I agree with you because I think they did try to do all that world building, but from Anna's perspective, which I agree, there's a lot of plot holes. Um, and I don't know about plot holes. Do you... There's pieces missing, my friend. I'm sorry. Unless you can fix them for me right now, right here, right now. The only the only thing that I didn't understand 100% and mm -hmm. I think it's just some fiddly thing with the powers that I didn't comprehend was how did Cersei heal her stabby stabby yeah um she woke her powers woke man the power the force awoke in her exactly um, yeah I wasn't sure how that went down mm -hmm. but I, I can't it was either Anna or Isabella one of them said and I think they they hit it on the head here this would have made an even better Disney plus show Yes, because that was on it. So much ground to cover. There is a lot of ground to cover. There is now. I don't know if they could have. I see. I don't know what budgets are like for Disney Plus shows because the shows look great. I mean, all of Loki, WandaVision, Falcon, they all looked great. But you need a blockbuster budget to do the things that happened here. Like just the Celestials alone mm -hmm. is just. That, that, that was my favorite aspect of this whole thing was seeing how the celestials work and some of them are red and yellow and there's uh, a blue one and the green one looked mean <laughs> and i'm just like when's that purple one come on we know he's coming <laughs> we know there's a purple one around the corner just just get him just get, just get him. him just bring well wait well i'll wait i don't care the visuals were stunning yes they the, were the power the way the powers worked each person's powers looked gorgeous and i mean i i didn't think it would be possible to say this but the MCU has somehow outdone themselves with costumes. Yes. Yeah. I have never seen, like, every single character, and there's a lot of characters, every single one of them was an action figure collector's wet dream. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's true though. They they look like they they look like a true true to form comic book outfit, which is kind of neat. Uh, the colors are very beautiful. Icarus, like I've never seen blue that vibrant. As the yes. Is, oh. Yeah. And the suit kind of like it's kind of one of those like it's kind of one of those superhero suits that does remain true to the comics. I think that if you were to literally translate like page to the screen, that's what a comic book suit will look like. It's mm -hmm. kind of this liquid armor kind of look. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like the effects were absolutely stunning. The characters powers were all just absolutely beautiful to watch. Um, surprisingly enough, like though it, like a lot of people are commenting that Icarus kind of looks and feels like Superman effects wise. Mm. Um, he's not the most fascinating one in terms of powers, like in terms of visual on the powers. I mean, Gilgamesh was gorgeous the way they kind of did this glowing fist around his, uh, around his own fist. Yeah. Um, Athe uh, or sorry, Athena's weapons designs were Athena just stunning. Bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think some of the characters that surprised me the most, Kingo actually brought a lot of gravity to the characters in a really fun, entertaining way, but still keeping the emotional weight. Yeah. Um, and I also like uh, Makari. I mm -hmm. thought Makari uh, doing her version of storytelling was just absolutely just a joy to watch. And it kind of makes you focus more, which was kind of yeah. neat. Did you have, like going into it, was there somebody who you were expecting to be your favorite and then did that end up being right yeah i was expecting icarus to really take the center stage but he doesn't he kind of takes a weird he doesn't take the center stage as much as you think he he takes the center stage but he doesn't walk it in a straight line no that's the thing though like i think he doesn't he doesn't stand firm in the center stage whereas you know someone like cersei does cersei's yes. cersei gets the limelight and it's a beautiful it's kind of a beautiful moment that she has. But um, yeah, I'd say Icarus was the most surprising, like the most surprising for me because I thought he was, he's a big character in the comics and he didn't, he, he's, he's an interesting one in the movie. He is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, I went in thinking Kingo was going to be my favorite because I just love Kumail. Yeah. Uh, he's awesome. So funny. I don't know if you've ever met my cousin Ryan, but he looks exactly like Kumail. Like a picture Kumail as an Italian man. My cousin Ryan, like exactly. That's awesome. Um, and I loved Kumail, but I ended up uh, attaching the most to Makari. Oh, she yes. was so cool. Um, I, I loved Such her. Such a fun, so fun to watch. Yeah, running around, doing her thing. And she was, she seemed to be the, the beacon of hope on the team, no mm -hmm. matter what. Like, you can't, like, nothing dampens her spirits. So I loved yeah. that about her. Uh, I was also, I should have known better, but I also went in somehow thinking Salma Hayek was going to be the main character. Mm -hmm. uh, but it yeah. was all, Gemma Chan it was the lead and like that's cool I loved her but for some reason I thought like oh the, I don't know why I, I guess because they said Ajax the leader so I was like okay so Ajax going to be our, our main we're going to focus on her yeah uh, but I like the direction they took with her and she was a really cool character too so they the, she was the leader but yeah, and, and again, reminder of spoilers here. She was the leader, but in the end, she kind of dies pretty early in the story. And mm -hmm. then and then throughout the rest of the story, she's like memories. Yes. Um, and I loved that. I love that yeah. they went the route of like Godfather Part 2, where it's like, here's some present day stuff for a while, and now we're going to go back for a while, and then jumping around. It, mm -hmm. it just it added to the epic feel of it. Yeah, so the, the movie starts off with, um, with Cersei... Uh, being late for university um, kind of like I'd say the main principal story kicks off with her uh, being um, a teacher on earth mm -hmm. um, they do kind of get to one of the first missions of the, the Eternals and it's very brief and then she ends up like oh yeah you know giving someone the knife by the way uh, one of the things people were betting on when the Eternals arrived was that beach scene with the Macedonians or Mes Mesopotamians. 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 Um, that particular scene people thought were Atlanteans. No. No, yeah, they're just some Mesopotamians hanging out on a beach. Yeah. Fighting a deviant. That's it. And, and then that mission kind of ends very quickly. Um, and they kind of, there's a little moment there. And then it kind of goes into present day with Cersei. And then we're introduced right away to a character I actually thought would have a little more storytelling, but they kind of served as a more of a cameo in yeah. the long run. He just bookended the movie. He didn't yeah, really... he's kind of a bookend. Mm -hmm. He's the beginning and the end of the book. Um, but 
the interesting thing is, is they already like they do the Marvel thing, which is like they're like, by the way, that's Black Knight. Like, yeah. like you know, like as a comic fan, you know the name, so you know who it's gonna be, and literally that's all they do. They're like, hey, that's his name, and then at the end, by the way, he's Black Knight. Do you think, do you think he wants to be a ranger of the North? Yeah, I, oh, I think he is. I think he's gonna be a. He knows how to. Sorry. Can you do I, that voice for the rest of the podcast? <laughs> God no. Um, I know how to do it. Uh, anyway. But I, I love that he was there because he has such a critical story with Cersei. But that's the interesting part is like essentially they establish their love story and that's it. It's all you get from him. Mm-hmm. Is that he is he's literally uh, Cersei's little, you know, side piece. Ooh, that's exactly what he's <laughs> I, I will say this about Dane. He's the first time in any Marvel movie that I've ever seen a proxy for myself. Oh, on the screen. interesting. Uh, because when he tried to jump that fence and he's like, nope, stairs. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, I mean, he's a, he's an interesting character because, like, again, he, he does kick off that love story. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, his overall arc is weird. It's weird throughout the movie. Um, and it kind of serves a weird purpose. But yeah, I think it's because he is the legit connection between Cersei and humanity. Like yeah. through like I talked about how Cersei is a connection between Eternals and humanity, but you know, for her to like love, love humanity, he's that Rosetta Stone, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. That that foc- that focal point. Um so yeah, that was interesting. And then they kind of so what happens is it kind of becomes a Magnificent Seven experience where they go and find the other members uh, mm-hmm. pretty early on. And the Deviants, they do a good job of explaining what the Deviants are, I think, in a really simplistic way. They do this kind of side-scrolling, or sorry, the text-scrolling Star Wars thing at the beginning of the film mm-hmm. and, ex- and do a perfect job of explaining literally what the Deviants are. They crave on intelligent life. They are the anti-life. They, they just like to consume it. And then they give them much more purpose later on in the film. That sounded like a DC reference, sir. I am I'm teasing the DC reference yeah. in this one. I am because, because they're going to cross over. In the well, next no, movie. because Ker- Jake, <laughs> I knew it. No, because Jack Kirby, um, uh, when he designed uh, the Eternals and all those the Celestial Gods and stuff, that same art style went over to DC at one point because Jack he did, did the new gods there. Yeah, too. he did the new gods. Yeah, when you want gods in comics, you get Jack. That's, yeah, you get yeah, you get Jack. You just get Jack. You call Jack. I mean Jack. You're I like, need yeah, God. I need the king. You know, it's it's the thing. Um, and so yeah, so there's a similar design reference. Although my brother brought a, brought up a good point. Um, speaking of celestials, uh, mm-hmm. is that they kind of went like uh, Chloe and the design team. Kind of went for a more organic look um because like my brother was saying the one thing he loved in terms of kirby designs was guardians and thor ragnarok because when they make the reference to celestials you could tell they, they they really do homage to jack kirby's designs uh-huh. but this one was kind of like the same it sounds bad but hear me out it's it's kind of this what kind of like what michael bay did with transformers they're less boxy looking and more like human organic looking i i understand yeah that, that's a good way to put it uh because michael bay took very simple designs mm. and overcomplicated them just for the sake of realism yeah um like to the point where it didn't really work because every decepticon looked like every other decepticon but i i don't know what the the uh, celestials looked like in comic form they're more boxy looking they're more boxy okay here at least maybe it was the color coding but it mm-hmm. was like it never looked bad like they were my favorite aspects of this was the celestial like oh well, give me more of those yeah so i liked the way they designed them and i i, I thought that they were scary i love that the first time you see what's his name alathon what's the big guy's name oh i Ar- Ar- it's like Aramis or something Ar- like that. Ar- Ar- he's, he's, it's like Aramis. Yeah. It's something like that. Ar- Aramis. There's like a TH in it. He's a big deal. I, I should be remembering this. But yeah. anyway, he's like their boss. He's like the god of gods. Yeah. And he, I love that the first few times you see him, he's so big that his, like you're looking at his nose area and you see Ajax just like this big on the screen. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, that that was a I cool watched. scene, though. That was, yeah. 
I will admit that that visually looked really cool. And I, I feel like they're getting the audience ready for certain things. I, that's what I feel like this movie was. It's an exp Whether it succeeded or failed, it's getting the audience ready for like some pretty epic space stuff. Um, very mystical space stuff, I think, is probably the best way to say it. As I, as I, as I was telling our, our little group of friends, the space gods. Yeah. We're getting into like space gods and magic and religion and that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, but like the... The design was, it was cool to see that effect and that scale. Like, it, it, I think they really played with scales a lot. Mm -hmm. Because Celestials were massive. And like, then, just you, huge. When you see Tiamat and he, you know, at first you're, you're thinking like, oh, is that his head I'm looking at that, that's coming out of the water? That giant thing? It's like, no, that's his thumb! <laughs> ah, that's... that's we'll, we'll get to that, we'll yeah, get to that. But, yeah. okay, so, so we talked about expectations going into this film. And we talked a little bit about storytelling, and we kind of introduced the rhythm of the story. So next thing I want to talk about is the relationship of the characters. Uh, into every character gets kind of like a spotlight moment, an introduction, if you will. But one thing I do, do think I love about this film, if I were to like extract it piece by piece, is the relationship of the characters. Yeah. The chemistry, the acting, the dialogue, it's all there. It's all there. Kingo is really fun to watch. Uh, I actually loved how introspective Droog was. I think he was kind of an interesting, quiet character, but he, when it's his time, he really pulls things in and makes things very twisted. Um, and and it's, it's really fun to watch. Uh, and then um, Angelina Jolie does a great job with Thena. She seems very, um, very destroyed, mm -hmm. distraught uh very yeah just very broken uh which is an interesting part of her story do they take it far enough i don't think they give you enough context to really go far enough there's a scene so we're as we're going back in time and learning about the different missions and the evolution of humanity there's a scene with Thena where they talk about you know how she's been alive for so long that she's gotten this disease that's like breaking her mind essentially. What's it called? It's like Mad Mind or something? Yeah, Mad Mind or something like that. It, it sounded, I, I loved how the name of this thing that she had, this affliction, sounded so like innocent and childish. It's like, mm -hmm. I have a head boo boo. <laughs> like it was like a word like that. It, yeah. sound, it sounded like in Cloud Atlas with the way they talk when they're in like the far future. Yeah. <laughs> Like you speak the true true. Uh, I wish the it's like I have the mad pox. Ah, why can't I remember what it's called? But it's so it's such a cool little word. Yeah, it was. I don't know. It's it's like a D word or a U word or something like that. But it was. But yeah. But and essentially, her mind is degrading, and and she goes into this like super kill mode. But again, going back to the relationships, her and Gilgamesh have a beautiful mm -hmm. kind of relationship without it being an actual intimate relationship. It's just a very kind of affectionate friendship. Okay. I think is the best way to put I it. I think that is a good way to put it. When we first saw them on the beach, I was like, those two are doing it. Mm. Um, but, but they weren't. They weren't. You're right. Afterwards, when we saw it and we got peeled back some layers, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, they're just... They're just hanging out in Australia having pies. They're really protective of each other, I think, mm -hmm. which is kind of which is kind of very beautiful. Um, speaking of relationships, Cersei and Icarus, uh, definitely a relationship in the comics uh, at one point, and uh, of course, Cersei has a relationship with uh, Dane Whitman as well. Um, and we get a love scene. It, not, how, what's the, how long has it been since Iron Man one? We get a sex scene. It's about time. <laughs> I feel like we have been waiting. An eternity? Oh! Wow! <laughs> now, I, I remember you saying many moons ago mm. uh, that of all the actors in the MCU, the one you have the biggest crush on is Gemma Chan. Gemma so Chan, it's like they Fox. knew. They knew. They were like, Ryan's gonna be watching this. We should, if we're gonna do one scene, we'll just we'll just throw him yeah. this. And they just imagined me as Mad Mc or uh, Mad not, Richard Madden. Richard Madden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, like, okay. So, but going back to the relationships, yes. Uh, Cersei and Icarus have a beautiful love story. And I think mm -hmm. it's well captured throughout the entire film. Yes. Um, because you really understand the journey of the relationship they have, and you like there are points where you can like you know if you've been in relationships you kind of 
have those moments and and they're they're really well done um i also love the relationship between uh makari and uh droog i think though that's a kind of a fun mm -hmm. they're kind of just mischievous and and they're you know it's one of those things where they're like we're in a relationship but we don't put labels on it like it's kind of that rebellious relationship kind of attitude which is kind of fun uh and the humor was so well done it, yeah. it didn't it didn't break the flow of the movie. It wasn't. It wasn't forced. It was just very natural, and it fits so well. Um, so I love that. And, and like I said, um, uh, also, uh, yeah. So Makari and Droog, and then of course we have the relationship between not like any intimate relationship, but the friend relationship between Kingo and Sprite as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fust Fustus has uh, Faustus. Fastus. 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 Yeah, he has relation. He's kind of like the just the paternal figure of mostly everybody. Um, uh, and yeah, so all the characters have wonderful relationships with each other uh, and they're very well done. And they're told very well. It, that's where the story gets kind of convoluted though because there's a lot of principal characters in this story. And there are. Apparently there were, in the first draft, even more. There were 12 of them and they whittled it down to 10 because Chloe Zhao said some of them were redundant and yeah. it's like, you know, everybody's getting less screen time. So she just kind of consolidated, uh, which I think was smart. Makes sense. Yeah, because you have 10 plus Dane plus Kingo's buddy. Uh, like, that's that's a good amount, and especially mm -hmm. because we're meeting all of them for the first time. Right. Um, but the, the way they interplayed off one another was the cornerstone of the... If that did not work, Eternals would not work. Right. But they got it. They got all those crisscrossing relationships you mentioned. It was all laid out there in front of you. It all had layers to it. I love that the plot of this was essentially, we were rock stars once. We got to get the band back together and do one last concert. Uh, but, oh, psych, the concert is going to be bad news because some drama happened in the band. There's, you know, a, a little bit of a Yoko tossed into the mix now. What's going to happen? Uh, and I, I think that that is... You know, we always talk about how every Marvel movie is a different thing. Captain yeah. America is a political thriller, etc. To make this one, uh, let's put the band back together, biblical story. Ah, like, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Chef kisses everywhere. Love it. Um, I, I, Druig, I was worried about Druig because I was worried going in that he was going to be the, the villain and he's going to be like, oh, snap, in the third act, I betrayed everybody. Um, they were kind of pointing in that direction with a lot of the promo material for some reason. Mm -hmm. And I was worried because I'm like, that sounds way too much like the Inhumans show. Yes. He even looks like the guy who plays Maximus. Nah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, no, don't do that. Uh, but luckily that's not where they went at all. And Druig was cool. He's kind of he's kind of like the character that kind of makes you see the shades of gray. Yes. Like he's always doing the shades of gray thing, which could make him easily look like the villain, but he's not. He's not the villain in this one, no. um, which is interesting. We'll get to who the villain actually is. It's me. I'm the it's one. totally Fantasia <laughs> uh, the whole time. And I have, um, there, there's a handful of actors that I, they just rubbed me the wrong way. You know, oh, this no. very small handful of who actors is it? who rubbed me the wrong way. And one of them is it Richard? Is Angelina Jolie. <gasps> um, the gasp. Yeah, there's, there's just something about her, the way she talks, the way she carries herself. I'm like, you don't talk like a normal person. There's something off. Uh, but I loved her work in this movie. Mm -hmm. I, I loved how Thena was kind of a weirdo. You know, like she's, she's the one who's kind of in the back of the room, like looking at her, at her hand and like playing with a knife or something. We're just like, we got to keep an eye on her. I loved that. I love that they made her. Yeah, she's this like cool warrior and she looks awesome and she's got these light swords. Mm -hmm. Again, Fantastic. It looks gorgeous when she does it. Yeah. So good. Uh, but like, and that would have been a baseline. That would have been enough. But on top of that, they added like, oh yeah, she's also kind of a nut. Like she's, she's like Drax. If Drax was less cuddly and more dangerous. And a woman. And a woman. So like. It, it, so like Gamora? <laughs> it's like she was, she was so. You know, she was this ticking time bomb, and she's just off there in the corner, like, <laughs> and that I liked that they they did that with her, mm -hmm. and it gave her this extra little pop that I thought mm -hmm. really made the character work. Yeah, no, very true. Um, so yeah, I mean, like char the characters. I think the real gem of this movie is the characters, the relationship with the characters, mm -hmm. which in a lot of interviews, if you watch it, that kind of what everyone's alluding to is the, is the relationship because. 
Um, one thing I'm noticing with the Marvel movies now is they're heavily focusing on like the theme of family, yeah. uh, which will play, which will be interesting when Fantastic Four comes crawling around because that's the central story of Fantastic Four as well. Uh, so they get into the Space God story a little bit. So Deviants start attacking out of nowhere again. Um, but what's interesting is they start getting Eternals powers. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of makes it, you know, makes the story a little bit interesting. Now, when it gets to Ajax talking to Aramis or Aramathy or whatever, is, whatever Space God's name is. I'm going to look up his name because it's bothering me that I can't remember. It's like Ar Arathis. Arathis. Something like that. I'm going to stick with Arathis. So Arathis, uh, she goes to talk in talking to him and they explain the whole journey of celestials now what's interesting is is that ajax gets killed pretty early in the film as we mentioned before r.i.p r.i.p and uh what ends up happening is this like gem comes out of her and goes into cersei and then she's able to talk to erethus and she learns a little bit later in the film that um you know uh celestials decided to create Erishim. Erishim. That's his name. Yeah. There you go. Erishim uh, decides to create these creatures uh, who have the ability to evolve and live a very long life. And they started to evolve to becoming predators and eating intelligent life. But um, celestials need intelligent life to create the energy required to create more celestials. That's, that's the explanation of the story they're going for. Cersei learns about this history uh, and learns that the Eternals were created without the ability to evolve, um, but they're 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 created with the ability to be like super powerful. Like essentially, they created like a in like a D and D game a level hundred hero, um, so the hero can't grow anymore in terms of experience, but the hero is like super powerful, and their job is to wipe out the deviants. So after the planet amasses enough intelligent life. They, uh, the Eternals defended from a Deviant so they can keep amassing and getting enough intelligent life to acquire the power needed to create Celestials. Interesting story. I'm going to buy it. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I think it's kind of a fun way to build off of these Marvel characters. Um, kind of interesting thing here I find is that, and this is my problem with the film, is because they didn't go far enough with that. <laughs> they kind of explained the origin of Celestials, but they didn't... They didn't go past purpose. Um, and the movie does foreshadow that a little bit. Ajax talks about, you know, hey, you guys are super powerful. You did your job. Go find purpose and tell me what you find afterwards. Um, Celestials, yeah, they, you know, they're they're going to wipe out humanity, you know, bada bing, bada boom, get more Celestials. Life is happy. Everyone, you know, circle of life moves on. Uh, and that's kind of the general feeling with Celestial's role in this. Turtle's role had a bit more interest to them because you kind of get a better story of like essentially why they were created and mm -hmm. like what their purpose is. Um, and then thus creates the conflict is that Cersei's like, okay, we got to stop them from, you know, essentially creating the Celestial that's going to blow up the earth, which to me got interesting because I'm like, the whole premise is, is they want the Celestials to consume intelligent, intelligent life enough to create a Celestial, and then they, you know, they move on and create more lives and more planets to create more intelligent life to create more Celestials. So Cersei's like, nah, I ain't about this, we're gonna stop this, and then Celestial God dude's like, hey, no, you need to let this happen because there's a balance to life, which is interesting. I think that's going to play a big role later on. Mm -hmm. There's a balance. Uh, and so she's like, well, no, we're not going to do that. I ain't about, I ain't going to be getting rid of this life. So I'm like, okay, well, if you can't let life live, then you need to let death come. So I thought there was kind of a nod or some sort of kind of, subtext to galactus well yeah because galactus is a celestial yes he's a big purple one and he yeah. erishim said right at the end you know not to jump ahead but he's like i'm gonna judge i'm gonna look at your memories and i'm gonna judge this world mm -hmm. and i'll determine whether it's worth saving and i'm figuring if he determines no that's when he calls his purple friend and he's like hey yo send your herald and the galactus is like new phone who dis um <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about the deviants for a minute. Yeah. Because I was on the way here, I was chatting with Tiago on the phone, and he had just come back from watching this as ah, well. And we were okay. chatting about it for a bit. Good timing. And uh, yeah, I um, 
you know, again, with the deviance, I had no idea what to expect. I went into this movie, though, just based on what I read about the movie, expecting Crow the Deviant to be our main villain. Yes. Um, and I guess he was-ish, but... Question mark. The thing is, it takes a long time for Crow to show up. Yeah. And by the time Crow shows up, we already know about Tiamat. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's like, okay... You're a big celestial who, I mean, you're a big deviant who talks now. Great. But we have bigger problems. Yeah. There's a thing growing. Like we, dude, like we, we got shit to take care of. We, we don't have time for your tentacle juice. Um, so I thought that was an interesting choice of having Crow kind of be spotlit as this villain early on. In the, and I, I, I'm sitting here wondering if the movie could have been better served without him in it. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of thinking too. It needed more of a centralized point and it doesn't have that because again, what you think is the villain isn't the villain. To which we could get to the next part, which is who is the villain? And the real villain here is Icarus. Because yeah. Icarus learned of the truth before all the events of the whole movie takes place um, and he ends up killing Ajax for it. He's like, yo... Because uh, Ajax explains the same thing. She's like, I've been talking to Super Space God Dude, and this is what we are, this is why we exist, blah, blah, blah. And Icarus is like, well, I, I live for the mission, and now you're telling me the mission's a lie, and it's this whole thing. And he gets really upset, and he ends up like feeding her to the Deviants, literally. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of makes Icarus the villain. And then it becomes... The final battle scene is is essentially, you know, them versus Icarus. Uh, and again, why do they hate on, like, the Superman beings, guys? Like, what happened to loving Superman? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. get it. He, he looked cool every time he did yeah. his yellow eye thing. I was like, yes, more. Uh, I thought yellow was a great choice for his eye. Because yeah. they all had golden aspects to their powers. Yeah. Um, and I think, if I remember reading right in the comics, he has red vision and they yep. were like that's too superman-y mm -hmm. and i agree i like the gold better they did say though that like a lot of people are like oh it's you know the effects are a lot like superman and chloe chloe and kevin feige and all that kind of did a nice dodge of the question well they, sorry they kind of answered it in a really nice poetic way they're like we respect all superhero genre like all superhero types of movies and you know you might find there's some nice homages to other superhero films. So I like that. It's you know, kind of a nice You movie. know what? That's nice. That's a nice, classy, professional answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think my answer to that question would be like, Warner Brothers, if you hate it so much, why aren't you fucking using Superman? Oh. <laughs> you have <laughs> Superman. And you're like, no, we're good. No, we'll do no, Batman. It's okay. I want to make another Harley Quinn movie. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Warner Brothers executive. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're not going to use them, why don't you give them to people who actually know how to play with their toys? Oh, my God. Where have you been? <laughs> I love it. All right. So, yeah. So, Icarus becomes the villain. Uh, the final battle is, is just an all-out, all, just awe. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, and the fight was really smart. And, and there was kind of clever ways of how they defeated the villain um, yes. in that way. Uh, in the end, it was the power of love, you know, defeats, love. defeats the villain. Uh, but it's cool because they do reference the Unimind, which is something the Eternals do. They like put their souls together and they become one supermassive being. And this mm -hmm. one, it's a little more just a yellow uh, bright light, essentially. I love that visual, though, and mm -hmm. the music that they went with. Ramin Jawadi composes music. Yes. And uh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of the most gorgeous sequences of the movie. Yeah. And you know what I haven't seen in a movie in a long time, and I was so happy to see it here? Mm. A volcano. You know how long it's been since I've seen lava in a movie? <laughs> a magma. It's been, I, we, we got too worried about gritty realism, yeah. and we forgot to have fun with lava. Yeah. No, for sure. And, and it, it's a great, it's a beautiful landscape, for sure. Um, and yeah, so the fight scene's really cool. Sprite also kind of has an interesting story arc through this whole thing. I think there's a beautiful scene with her and Kingo, and he kind of does a really cool analogy in explaining her relationship with with Icarus. And you know what's so weird about that is mm. I'm literally looking at her mm. in that scene before Kingo opens his mouth. I'm looking at Sprite and I'm like, she would play an awesome Peter Pan. She looks just like Peter Pan. Yeah. And doesn't he freaking say, Yeah, he drops you ever the... read Peter Pan? Like, 
He's like, no, because like he essentially says she's Tinkerbell yeah. and she loves Peter Pan, but they can never be together. And it's and and they do foreshadow Sprite's story in the very beginning, like with Cersei. Um, but it's it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting how they do it. And I, I like her story. I do. I because she's like deprived. Essentially, she's deprived of the full experience of living a full life because she's only at a specific age, mm -hmm. um, which was a, a really rude thing for what's his face to do to build her that way Arishan. yeah um I, by the way do you know who voiced Arishan? was it bill sarsgaard uh no that was crow oh he was crow okay Arishan was david k who you might remember as beast wars megatron what yeah. oh my god megatron was in this movie that's awesome yeah. <laughs> oh yeah the original original mate yeah the t-rex wow. yeah Oh, I love that Megatron. That was one of my favorites. Um, sorry, I thought you meant like Generation One. Oh, Megatron. Frank Welker. No, yeah, no, no, no. no. Um, but yeah, okay. So again, I think I, I think as a Marvel fan, if you're going to go into this film, don't worry about the lore. Do not even think about it because what this movie is all about is the relationship between the characters, um, and and the deviants are just kind of uh, a means to an end literally mm -hmm. uh so that's kind of interesting and the, the, this is where it gets interesting because the end i find is kind of neat in a weird way so because one i think they're testing the audience because literally the celestial that comes out of the planet at the end cersei does her job and she ends up transforming that celestial into ice i imagine i think it was rock because ice would melt and cause floods for oh yeah oh, it's stone right? let's yeah. leave it at that uh i don't know it's hard to say but the scale, the scale oh, is interesting. I love and I, th I think they're teasing Galactus. I really think they are. Because they're really testing what the scale of the villain is. Now, what's interesting, too, is that thing was pretty freaking massive. So it's going to, what I think is going to be interesting is it's going to impact the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the sense of any film in the future. Like, you can't... Like, for example, if the X-Men ever show up in the MCU and they use the Blackbird, as soon as they fly, like, north, or th nor yeah, north, maybe north, I don't know. Well, maybe it looked like they were in the Pacific with all those volcanoes. So, south is. Ring of Fire there. Yeah, south. Yeah. So if they fly south, they're gonna they're gonna cross it pretty easily. Yes. Like, it's it's pretty massive. And I love that. It's like, remember in the in the Tick, when Shareface starts writing his name in the moon? And they stop him, and then but the rest of the series, there's the letter C H in yeah. the moon. It's like that, like it's gonna be there forever. Yeah, and, and it's right. huge. It's, it's so massive. big, and I love that. It just the idea that it's there now. It's yeah. just part of Earth. There's a landmass that looks like a big dude, and I guarantee you, you know who uh, is not happy about that? Who? Oh. Namor. What are you doing to my ocean, bro? Ooh. What's this? You put a man? Did you kick your statue in my yard? Yeah. Hello. Freaking surface dweller and uh, yeah, space dweller in this case. He is going to be fear when he comes out in Black Panther two. Furioso. He's going. Wakanda going to be like, hey, what's up? Welcome to Wakanda. Who are you? And he's like, I'm the pissed off dude that you guys threw a big ass rock shaped man in my uh, in, in my my backyard. What's up with that? And Wakanda's like, we didn't. <laughs> I don't know what that. That's not us. So I, I I wholeheartedly agree. I I think the oceans are definitely impacted in this movie in in great way. They talk about glaciers melting. They talk about a whole bunch of things. Um, so Namor is going to be an interesting character with the, with the effects of what's going on in the MCU thus far. Mm -hmm. um, so then what happens is is that you know Cersei and talk about book it bookend. Cersei rendezvous back with Dane Whitman, who throughout the movie she has one conversation with him. And, and they're setting up Black Knight fairly quickly with very little context. Like, beginning of the movie, you know it's him. His name's Dame Whitman, and he teaches, like, history. In the middle of the movie, she's like, you should talk to your uncle, which is, like, the key to his origin story completely. And at the end of the movie, we get to him in, in the room. And I'll explain one other teasing factor. There's a scene with Athena where she's going through Makari's stuff. After Athena, s she'll be very mad if you don't drop Sorry, there. God, mm -hmm. Athena. There's a scene with Thena where she's in Makari's room after makari has been living on the ship for God knows how long and collecting all these artifacts. She picks up a sword and Sprite goes, oh, is that the ebony blade? Clearly teasing the Black Knight because that's what his famed sword is called, right? And she's like, no, it's the X, yeah, the Excalibur. Then it fast forward to the end of the film. Um, oh, I didn't even get to one of the other parts. So 
In order to create the Unimind, they need the tool that connects them to space god named... Uh, er Aragorn, son of Arathorn? Hold on. <laughs> Aramathis or Aramathias or Aramas. Why, why is it so Atheus. easy to forget Atheus. this word? Something like that. Not a theist. Hold on. I will... I am going to look this up even if it kills me. Erishem. 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 So, Erish, so the, the tool to create Unimind is the, essentially the, the gem that allows them to communicate with that guy. <laughs> and what happens is, is uh, Fustus breaks it down and creates the tools they need to create Unimind, which ends up being redundant anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that space god dude comes to Earth and he, there's a shot where it kind of starts off as if Galactus is coming. Clouds come in, weird lightning starts, and then as you zoom out, there's a bunch of meteors over the planet. So for me, I'm like, oh my god, is he, has he finally sent Galactus? And then that, this is like going to kick off Fantastic Four right out of the gate? But I'm like, that's too soon. It's mm -hmm. too way too soon to do Galactus. Um, so what ends up happening is uh, the Space God dude's like, look, and, and you talked about this earlier, uh, hey, you know, you you prevented this, but, uh, you know, now I'm going to take a look at all the memories and I'm going to see if, like, I'm going to test humanity to see if they're worth saving. And, and he takes them away. He takes away Cersei. Yeah. Who else was left on Earth? He took away a few, like, whoever Fastus. was left. Fastus. Fastus, that's right, yeah, because he's living there. And I guess Kingo. Kingo, Kingo yeah, right. Kingo, yeah. And so they they go and they get, I think they get their brains reset as well. Um, and they go. And then Dane Whitman... Uh, is just like what's going on because he sees Cersei get flown into this, the air. The other thing is too, everyone saw him. Everyone mm -hmm. saw Space God, so they're all running around on Earth, which is funny. Like, where would you run to? Like, guy that size. These poor people. Where like, are you gonna they, go? They've just had like this snap trauma. Are you gonna take SpaceX and just like yeah. just go around the orbit? Like, what are you gonna do? You they can't... come back from snap trauma, <laughs> and it's like, oh hey, what's up? COVID's a thing. <laughs> And now yeah. they're just getting over that when giant red space base shows up yeah. and a guy comes out of the ocean and he's bigger than life. These people in the MCU Earth must be just like, can we move? Yeah, can can you? Is that a bad thing? Yeah. So, so anyway, so then it goes back to Dane um, and he's just like, what happened? What happened? And then, then the movie's pretty much done. Like, that's it. it. Yeah. And so then we get the credits kick in and the first end credit scene is really interesting. It is. Um, it would have been more interesting if the theater had kept the lights off. Oh, yeah. Because the thing about Eternals is it's... The lighting is very natural. Very natural, very dim, and I'm not always a huge fan of that. It was fine here, but sometimes it can go overboard, like Solo, the Solo movie, and it's like, turn on a freaking light, please. In the movie. In the Yeah. Um, so here it was dim, and it, like... Some parts were like in the Amazon. I'm just like, what's happening? Uh, but the ship, the, the the Domo, is very dark. Yeah. And this scene takes place there, and they had the house lights on. So I think I saw what I saw, but I'm I'm just like squinting the whole time because I I really couldn't get a good look at what was happening. So major spoilers here again. Uh, if you're gone in this far, thank you once again. Make mm -hmm. sure you're following and, uh, and subscribing. Mm -hmm. um, leaving comments. And stalking. And stalking. Uh, so here's the interesting thing. So they drop Pip and Star Fox, which is interesting. These characters are pretty big in the kind of late 70s, early 80s run of the Avengers. Uh, and Star Fox has a lot to do with the Infinity Gauntlet. Um, which kind of is irrelevant now because that was the entire first, you know, chunk of fa that was like for the first four phases. So, yeah. so three, 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 three phases. Three phases. Yeah, that was the first three phases. So, um, I was I was looking up what are the things he's been involved in, and I was reminded that he's been involved in the Shi'ar Kree War, uh, mm -hmm. which is interesting, uh, and that war um, he ends up playing a role in. And through those events, he also causes the secret war. So kind of interesting, though, because you do have the scroll, uh, the secret invasion coming up. And you also have potentially a teaser for secret wars coming up. A couple teasers for secret wars, a couple pieces of evidence. So it was kind of interesting to see that. Um, Star Fox looked fantastic. His costume is pretty close to what he actually looks like in the comics. You can see it okay? A little bit, yeah. Literally, all I saw was a floating head, and I'm like, I think that's a guy. 
Yeah, it, yeah, it's uh, it was the musician Harry, Henry Golding, I think his name is, or whatever. Um, anyways, so that was interesting, and Pip, Pip was supposed to help kick off Infinity Gauntlet, so it's nice to see Pip in there, uh, who I believe was played by Patton Oswalt. That, that sounded was. like his voice. He was, yeah. That I was more excited for Pip because he, he's I knew about Pip as a character, like he was from the Silver Surfer cartoon. Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, oh, it's Pip the Dwarf. That's neat. Uh, even though I never would have in a million years expecting him to show up yeah i remember there was like a whole bunch of stuff online of people talking about this dude and what playing star fox yeah and i'm glad you're telling me this about like what he's involved in because every time i heard that i'm like i don't know who this actor is so who cares and i don't know who this character is so who cares yeah um and you know they made it like this big deal like look who's here it's star fox and i'm like who um and why is he not purple Good question. Why is he not purple? That's a thing. Mephisto confirmed. I knew it. Um, it it's interesting because because Fox is an Eternal. Star Fox is an Eternal. They established yeah, that because he's got the little bead mm -hmm. thing. Right and now. Thanos is a deviant. Uh, he's kind of a half deviant. So Ooh. it's kind of a near interesting thing there. Um, but yeah, interesting, interesting in credit sequence. Not sure what it means yet. I still don't know where this is going, personally. Uh, I still have to do some research, check out some other fellow hardcore fans, see what they're saying. Um, the, the, actually, the end credit sequence that fascinated me the most was the second one. Yes. Yeah, same. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a bit more familiarity to that, and there was build-up to it. Because that sword, man. There's something Ebony about a blade. sword wrapped in bandages, like a mummy. Like a mummified sword and then there's Mummy. magic words that appear on it oh yeah um i just i love the magic aspect so much more than the cosmic aspect mm -hmm. so anytime we start getting to magic i'm like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i loved it i thought kid harrison did this great job with with dane where he made him this sort of like not a coward but mm -hmm. he's just like flustered all the time and I, I like that. I think he's kind of like the average Joe that's yeah. like thrusted into this. And it's it's really interesting. Um, it's a nice change of pace because he was yeah. way too stoic as Jon Snow. So it's nice to see him play something a little different. I think he's going to be like the Indiana Jones of Marvel. Yes. Is kind of what I'm what I'm getting a hint of here. So the last end credit scene, guy, or everyone, what you kind of see is you see him open a case with his family crest on it, which was uh, the gift... It was a gift that was given to him at the beginning of the film for his birthday party. Cersei gives him a ring, and it's the original ring of his family crest. Um, and he opens it, and he, he, sorry, he opens a chest with the same emblem, and he lifts it up, and lo and behold, pulls out the ebony blade, and he's about to touch it, and he starts to hear voices. Uh, there's a weird message that says death will come or something like that. Uh, death, is, death is my reward. Death is my reward, yeah. Uh, which is true, ebony blade craves blood um and it's kind of one of those things where he will have eternal life as long as he's killing people that's the way the ebony blade works that's scary yeah but if he doesn't use it it'll take away his life so it's kind of this weird struggle of life that as long as he uses the sword um i'm not 100 sure if that's the case but i'm pretty sure that's that's what it is so it's an interesting thing um, but I love the setup there. Then we hear a voice, which to, at first I thought was Nick Fury, but then you dropped, I think, who it actually is. I think it's Kang. I think it's Kang, which makes sense because mm -hmm. this movie's about time. Yes. Yeah, so that's very... I mean, he is the long game as far as Phase 4 is concerned, right? Is Kang. So I think that's a safe bet. And I think... I could be wrong, but I think Black Knight's powers involve kind of hopping around time and, you know, some magic dimensions and stuff. Yeah. So it makes sense to me uh, because I have a feeling, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling that uh, they're not in any rush to make Eternals 2. I don't think there's any sort of push or demand no. at this point. Because it feels like everything that it's building with, you know, Black Knight is his own thing. Um, and even the big cliffhanger ending of like, I'm taking the Eternals and I'll be back. What Arishem says that, that could, his return could be, you know, an Avengers level thing like Avengers five or, you know, what fantastic four, even like it's, it doesn't have to be Eternals too. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and I like that aspect of it. I don't know. There's something cool about it. Knowing, not knowing, but 
there's something cool about not having it spelled out like there's going to be a trilogy of these because now it's like, okay, there's all these characters and they're all going to branch off and we don't know where or when we'll see them again. Mm -hmm. And I like that a lot. Um, the only, like, maybe the Star Fox thing could be in Eternals too because that seems rooted in their world. Yeah. But everything else, Black Knight, Arishem, it could really just touch the other corners of the MCU. Right. And it, here's the interesting thing. So talking about loose ends here, first of all, I think it's Bakari, Droog, and there's a third one. Uh, sorry, Athena. Uh, Bakari, Droog, and Athena. Mm -hmm. or, Athena. She's going to be so mad. Uh, so mad, yeah. Um, they are on the ship, and they didn't get their brains reset. They didn't even see the Space God dude. So they don't know what happened to Cersei, Faustus, and... Um, Kingo. Kingo. And Sprite, I guess she stayed behind. Yeah, but there. Sprite's human. Oh, yeah, but she still carries the memories, right? Yeah. So, so there's that too. Um, so, so there's a couple loose ends here, and I think Fox is going to help that. A couple of interesting players that need to be addressed that might help this story further. Doctor Strange mm -hmm. in the Multiverse of Madness, he could he could have some things that can tie these things together a little bit. Um, and then, of course, Guardians Volume 3, Ooh. because we got Adam Warlock. That's a good point, man. So I think he's going to help clear up some space there as well and tie some of these things together. And then um, I would like to say the Fantastic Four, but Space Gods are a little out of their realm. They deal more on, like, ego, like, mm -hmm. mm, you know, like, more scientific stuff. That yeah, makes sense. But, like, when I think Galactus, I think them. True. So. I mean, of course, they'll deal with Galactus. And yeah. they could deal with Celestials as well, um, which would make sense. I, I think on an MCU platform, yeah, I think you're right. You could do it that way. But I don't know. Personally, me, right now, if we're talking about the now, I think the next stories that will help Eternals move forward and kind of, again tie up some loose ends is definitely Multiverse of Madness and definitely Guardians of the Galaxy. Especially because Multiverse of Madness seems on track to be the Civil War. Yes. Uh, the, like the Avengers light movie, right? The one that's, yeah. it's not really called Avengers, but it's got so many in it, it might as well. Uh, it, that looks like that's what Doctor Strange is going to be. So yeah. it makes sense put as many people in it as you possibly can so so we're gonna see where this goes from here but uh yeah so those in terms of movies and trying to connect all those movies that's where that's going mm -hmm. there's also a reference to a tablet that uh, makari has been looking for i'm kind of curious what kind of tablet that i, I want to look into yeah, that gosh this jade tablet they keep bringing up i thought it was the tablet of time for <laughs> probably like a good 30 seconds and then i then i'm like nah and then Silvermane's going to come and show me. Like, Hi, Spider-Man. They call it they call it like Tia Tia Malut or something like that. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion as to why they keep bringing it up. I got to look into it. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know enough about that Marvel artifact or if it even is a reference to a Marvel artifact cuz sometimes Marvel will say it's something and then allude to it being something else just to kind of throw people off the trail yeah it might have been arbitrary too it might have yeah. been just there to set up the fact that a uh, makari likes to collect stuff mm -hmm. because that comes into play with dane whitman yeah, exactly so it might have just been there to set that up in which case that's fine um did you find it odd that kingo was not a part of the final battle at all mm, i don't know I don't think it was odd, personally. I actually, yeah, I think I'm gonna go with no. I don't think it was odd because I think what what's interesting is this movie. One of the kind of subjects it tackles is it's okay to have different opinions, mm -hmm. and and some people take part in it, some people don't. Right. So yeah. so I'm not like a hundred percent like oh my god like why wasn't he fighting, but I'm I'm kind of like okay. You know, if that's how it's, it's kind of like one of those feelings of like, if that's how you feel, that's your opinion. Like, but, you know, obviously they're, they're trying to say, like, I don't feel like you're you're doing the right thing here, but I'm not going to I'm going to respect what you, you know, I'm going to respect your values. Yeah, you're right. It, it's it's not something where I was like, this is why is he not here? This is BS. Uh, it was just it was so strange because I'm, I'm watching this fight and I'm like, yeah, everybody's teaming up on Icarus. I'm like, wait, no, everybody's not. Kingo's not here. And I was trying to remember, like, what did he say when he when he left? And it, you're right, it is that sort of thing that this is a very personal 
quasi religious thing for them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, their connection to Ereshem. And I love how beautifully that was spelled out with Ajax and Icarus, mm -hmm. where he was so zealous about it that he was like, no, we cannot go against Ereshem and I will kill you if you try. And she like, it breaks her heart because she's like, I, I turned you into this. I raised you this way. And, you know, I raised you to not ask questions. And that was my fault. That was so cool. So you're right. There, there are these, these paths they're taking that are so spiritual. And that was Kingo's sort of thing. It's just like, I, this feels wrong to me. I can't do this, but I'm not going to stop you. I'm just going to enjoy what time is left with these people because I've grown to love them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's... It, it's jarring that he's not in the climax just because we're used to that in comic book movies. But the more I think about it now, the more beautiful it is. It is. It's, 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 it's so cool. It's well done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so overall, that's the, you know, I, I feel like we covered a lot of ground and like, I think this movie thrives in its relationship with the characters. Try not to get too wrapped up in the details of the lore. I think there's a lot of hidden gems here that maybe they're holding back for a reason or we might just, I, yeah, holding back for like future storytelling. But overall, I, I really feel like what what you will appreciate is, is again, the characters themselves and the relationship, the, the kind of dialogue and stuff they have with it. Everything else is kind of just formality in a way of saying like there's there's a battle, there's a battle of good and evil that needs to be fought and who's who's good who's bad and that's kind of interesting here and they do talk about that they talk yeah. about the the relationship that they have are they good or are they evil um so overall i do think it was a past marvel film like i think it was a good marvel film it definitely deserves to be a part of the echelon of marvel films and and it deserves to be within the rankings does it rank fairly high as a marvel film personally me i don't think so i i think that i think it's good I think Chloe, <laughs> I think Chloe did a great job, but it it tries to tackle very complex stories with the Eternals, and at the same time, it's not working with a full deck. So it's kind of you're kind of you're kind of trying to figure things out, and I think the movie wants you to feel that way, but at the same time, it doesn't give you all the answers. So. It's kind of it's kind of an interesting thing I had with it. So I think it's good. I think it's passable film. Do I think it's the best film? No. Do I think it's the worst? No. I think it's somewhere in the middle. That's fair. That's fair. I really liked this one. This has been my favorite Phase Four film mm. so far. Um, it was it, it hit a lot of right notes for me. I love the world building of it. I love the epicness of it. I loved all these characters. I loved how I kept getting surprised by them and mm -hmm. how they were going to turn out to be, which was nothing like what I initially assumed they would be. Um, I want more Celestials. I want a whole scene that's just Celestials talking to each other and every one of them is a different color and they're like, let's talk yeah. about planets. Uh, I don't know what they talk about in their spare time. Their mm -hmm. lives must be pretty dull. <laughs> um, I I think that I because I went in expecting zero familiar mcu like i was never expecting like i wonder if thor is gonna pop up like that was never a thing mm -hmm. so i didn't have any kind of disappointment of like we didn't see anybody familiar uh it was all new people and i liked that i liked that it was just fresh ground and i can't wait to see where they all mm -hmm. pop up next because we know they're, they're, the eternals will return they said so in the credits. They did too. say that. They did say the Eternals will return, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and it, it said dot, 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 and I thought it was going to say the name of a movie, and I was really, really... Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be It's going to be interesting, for yeah. sure. I think that... Um, I think the final thing I want to add to this is... Um, is for me... Oh, my God. I almost lost it. One second. I lost something earlier, too, and then I found it. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think that, uh, the interesting thing for me here is with Eternals, yes, it says the Eternals will return, um, but they didn't say when, they didn't say where, and I, th oh, the big thing I learned about this film is I only saw, like, one, maybe one or two trailers and one clip, and I had, knew nothing about it, but it was interesting, because when I went into this film, there was no boxes for me to check off. Usually mm -hmm. when I go see like a Captain America film or an Iron Man film, I see the trailer and already there are key scenes they put in the trailer that make me go, okay. And then in the movie, I'm like, okay, we saw that scene, we saw that scene, we saw this, so we know this. In this movie, I didn't have that. No. I did not have that at all. Like this movie, I was literally a passenger 
in the car. And Chloe was driving that car and and being like, hey, welcome to the world of Eternals. And that was such a giddy feeling. Yeah. You don't know where that ride... Like, literally, all the trailers gave me to take away from was there's going to be a lot of stuff on a beach and a lot of stuff in a forest. Mm -hmm. That's yes, it. That's it. And, and I love that the beats of the movie aren't showcased right mm -hmm. there in the trailer. I think... I'm going to say this right now. I'll heap some praise on Chloe's out here because she deserves it. I think that judging by what she did here, mm -hmm. she is the right person to finally do a big budget adaptation of a Cthulhu movie. Because uh, Guillermo del Toro has been talking about doing one for like 50 years. And it's like, dude, if you're going to do it, do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think she can do it. Interesting. She... She nailed in this movie. She showed she can nail big characters, both you know, emotionally speaking and physically speaking, like huge characters whose finger is the size of you know half a continent, and like cosmic strangeness and making it all cohesive and interesting and making me care about everything. Mm -hmm. That's a tall order. And Lovecraft stuff is notoriously known for being hard to adapt to film, but I think she can do it. I think she can visually tell those stories mm -hmm. and make it comprehensible yeah i mean can she do big like could she do an avengers kind of level story hell yeah i oh, think she's yes. i think one thing she did really well is demonstrate her ability to handle multiple characters because she does a good job with that mm -hmm. i think what i would like to see more is a more grounded story from her i hate using that word because like for example when people say i'm going to do a grounded fantastic four i just like cringe but but what I mean in this particular context is I, like, give her a story like Endgame and mm -hmm. see how he, she could, like, really push the relationship of these characters. I think she thrives in the dialogue between characters. Like, Icarus and, um, Icarus and Cersei was beautiful. Yes. Um, Droog and, and Makari was a great relationship as well. Kingo and Sprite, all these characters that I mentioned earlier about relation, Gilgamesh and Thena was was amazing. Ajak had relationships with every single character, and all of them were uniquely genuine. Um, and so that was really interesting. And so I think that's where she thrives. But this whole celestial god thing and like the backstory was kind of missed, and that's where the struggle I had with this film was kind of missed. But I, I think that's on purpose because I don't think Kevin Feige wants to rush this phase mm -hmm. uh, because as the film suggests, it's the end of an era and it's the beginning of a new one. Yeah. Uh, and I th to bring back full circle to the Silmarillion reference, I think, and tell me if you agree, but I think if any Marvel movie so far has deserved the Peter Jackson, let's extend it a bunch on DVD treatment, it's this. Yeah, I think I think we can expect to see a super extended edition. It's like a four hour cut. But uh, am I happy that we have Chloe Zhao and 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 that she did a Marvel movie and it was the Eternals? Yes, I'm super happy she did it. I'm super happy they took the risk and they did a movie of this scale because now you can now continue to go very weird with Marvel, which with something like Thor in the beginning, that's what we kind of said. Like, go weird. Don't be. Don't do Thor in New York because we've seen that. Like yeah. we've seen enough heroes in New York. Thor in Asgard is interesting because there's more to the Marvel Universe. And that's what this movie proved is that there's a lot more. Like a lot. Like a biblical sense yes. of the Marvel Universe. So on a scale of zero Infinity Stones Ooh. to six Infinity Stones or a whole gauntlet. How many stones are you giving it? I'm going to give it a four. Four stones. Four stones. All right. Chloe, I love your work. I think you have, you scream potential. But like I said, one of the problems I have with this movie is the backstory. You were, you went, you, you delivered on some key concepts, but the overall, the why of this, like, why is this story here? I don't think you quite captured it for me. And it's not your fault. I think you, you were given a very, you, you were very excited to do this story and it was very complicated. Um, but there's there's lore missing that needs to be told and to give give better context and that was my issue with it. That's fair. That's fair. There's a lot there. Um, uh, I really hope they give it the Peter Jackson treatment on Blu-ray because that would be sweet. Or uh, digital. And you know what? That's a nice incentive to buy movies. Uh, you know, yeah, Disney Plus you'll get Eternals the normal version, but 
if you really want more get the the extended cut i will gobble that up in a heartbeat mm -hmm. um i went 5.5 stones <sighs> yeah 0.5 you went for a half a stone this i time went too. for a half a stone i think that there's a lot of ground to cover this is very epic they did a lot of great things with it i i it is long but i think it could have been longer and maybe dare i say should have been longer and that's not me coming from my biased place of Andrew Loves Long Movies. It's me coming from, there's a lot to talk it's about. It's a big story. It's a big story. Uh, and, you know, this is movie 26, and we're meeting 26 new people. You kind of need to, to give all these people room to breathe. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's where I think it just loses me a bit. It's just like, Yes, get, get more in there. Show me what these people are like um, it, and give it that space to kind of really stretch and be what it needs to be. Because uh, some parts did really still feel restrained to, you know, the norm, mm -hmm. the cinematic norm of it's got to, you know, don't make it too long because we don't want to scare people. Uh, so, but overall, I thought it was a great motion picture and it was uh, everything I could have wanted this cosmic biblical story to be uh the tolkien levels were reaching critical mass and that makes me happy mm -hmm. 5.5 stones interesting stuff and uh there's a lot of characters to add from oh my god <laughs> we got icarus we got ajax we got uh you've got 10 Yukari. eternals yeah you've got dane and then you've got the two people we meet in the post credit scene mm -hmm. like pip a, and uh star fox yeah 13 oh and Arish, Aramish. Yep. Uh, the 14 crucial characters, maybe 15 if you count Crow. I don't even know if we should because he's not really a big deal. He's a deviant. He's a deviant. Yeah. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. 15 is a, a lot. lot for, and like, two and a half hours sounds like a long time. It's not when you have to introduce 15 characters who have never been introduced in a 25 film established world. Right. So. It's a lot. Um, but now, that being said, what's next? So at the time of this recording, which was done immediately after Eternals, um, we now have the big Marvel event coming up on November 12th. Oh, that, that event, yeah. <laughs> There's a, sorry, two couple, couple big yeah. events here. So we got the Marvel event that's literally coming up next week on November 12th. We have, um, we have Hawkeye coming up at the end of the month on November 24th. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we go into Spider-Man in December. And then we're on a bit of a hiatus, uh, as far as we know, till May, which oh, is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I think it's safe to say we'll get Miss Marvel before Doctor Strange. I have a feeling that might be the case. I do. I do. Maybe She-Hulk. Who knows? Right, because like that was Miss Marvel was supposed to be like December. Yes. How much could they possibly need to delay? Yeah. Um, could be timing though. It could. Yeah, it, it could be timing. Maybe they felt December was too crowded, which makes sense. So we have that five month gap. Throw her and put her in March. I think that's a great place for her. Put her in March. Yep, that lousy smarch weather. That lousy smarch weather, and then in a week from today. <laughs> We'll know the cast of Fantastic Four. You called it. I'm think thinking. I'm happen. thinking it's gonna happen. Uh, and you're gonna start. They're crying. teasing. Gonna they're like, teasing oh. some big things in Eternals. Yeah. I, I will tell you that. Just if you look at the scale and scope of that film, they're teasing some big things. Um, and I think it's very strategic that why the why. And so make sure you guys go see it. Um, as Marvel fans, if you're a hardcore Marvel fan, you will just love it. Mm -hmm. You're. Um, yeah, I think if you're a Marvel Cinematic Universe fan, you, I think you'll get a little bit more out of it because you just you don't know what's going on, so you're gonna just focus on enjoying it more, um, much like this guy. Like you're just gonna you're gonna really just kind of focus in and just really enjoy it. I think if you're kind of a casual fan, like if you're if you're kind of just in and out with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I don't think you're gonna get it. I really don't think you're gonna get this one. I don't think so. I mean, you could theoretically be a you could go to this movie not knowing about the mcu yeah and you wouldn't be because it's so off the charts um that it doesn't even zoom in on mm -hmm. anything mcu related except you know once in a while they're like thanos was a thing yeah 
Oh, and there's the Avengers. They lost this person. Yeah. Other than that, you know, I could take a, a grandparent who's never touched an MCU movie to see this, and they'd be like, "That was a nice story about Bible people." Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they, they, you know, it because it's so removed from everything else, and that's fine. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree. It's gonna. It's it's an interesting one, guys. This is a this is an experiment. I think it's a much necess a very necessary experiment, but it's interesting. All right, so. Eternals. Eternals. That's what it was. That's what it was. R.I.P. Ajax. R.I.P. Gilgamesh. Icarus killed himself, right? Yeah, he flew into the he sun. He flew into the sun, just like his name, or the namesake that was named after him. Mm -hmm. I didn't think the sun could kill him because he's so powerful, but I guess it, it's, it's the, the sun. sun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, R.I.P. Icarus. He was, uh, he was a good villain. I um, liked him. Yeah. Yeah. And R.I.P. this episode because it's over, but like R.J. said, we got some stuff coming up. We got some stuff coming up, and we got a holiday <laughs> special coming up that you are gonna love. So, yeah, look out for that. Where can people find you, Ryan, when you're not doing this? You can always find me on twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. Always giving you the latest Xbox games. Super exciting. Uh, we got Forza coming up, which is going to be pretty cool. Forza Azuri. Exactly. That's what we Italians say when there's a soccer game. Forza Azuri. And you can find me um, fighting a deviant in the sex chamber under my house <laughs> you can find me you can find me on uh, instagram uh and fantasia and on youtube and fantasia uh where i am talking about films and other things like that and on the rebel scum podcast network as well i just put out my final review video essay on no time to die uh which uh, the lesson we took away from no time to die is how do you end something that's never ended before mm -hmm. and i even in that video ryan bring up very briefly, the possibility of the end of the MCU. So that might be something curious people might want to hear about. I bring it up briefly. I'll probably talk about it again in the future because it is something that's always on my mind. But yeah, that's that. And uh, that's this episode of Infinity Rewatch. Until then, we are eternally grateful and have a marvelous day. Hey scumbags, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.